good morning guys so today also we are going to continue our discussion on some of the question which uh, you know have uh, picked from the medical quiz and this medical quiz was conducted a little while earlier and uh, i'll continue doing this in today's class some other medical quiz questions are also discussed this is a wonderful platform for discussing those questions because they are uh, quite clinical questions and some of them are mcq also okay but they are very very important from your exam point of view as well okay so please pay attention yeah now all of you please focus on this picture and what is the commonest type of congenital heart disease in this baby yes first what is the diagnosis here what do you think this baby is having and then uh, the question is what is the commonest type of congenital heart disease in this baby who can answer this anybody okay so let me let me tell that now the answer in this case is this baby is a down syndrome baby okay it looks like down syndrome look at the typical facial appearance this is known as a mongoloid face mongoloid face highly typical of a bit of slanted eyes okay slanted eyes uh, a typical epicanthal fold is not seen here actually uh, epicanthal fold is that is extra you know lead on the inner side of the eyeball or towards the inner canthus of the eye which is not uh, commonly seen here now once i identify this baby as a down syndrome baby the answer is very easy now we can all answer probably what is the commonest type of congenital heart disease in a down syndrome baby yes what is that endocardial cushion defect excellent endocardial cushion defect this is endocardial cushion defect also known as ostium primum defect ostium primum defect or atrioventricular canal defect these are the three you know uh, synonymous term which is mentioned in the different textbook so let me write that for you one is endocardial cushion defect ecd another is called ostium primum defect okay ostium primum defect and third is av atrioventricular canal defect and this is uh, considered a bit of serious type of congenital heart disease and it may lead to heart failure it may lead to repeated uh, you know chest infection and things like that let's move on see that the answer is endocardial cushion defect number 2 a 40 year old non case of hypertension presented with severe headache and vomiting for few hours duration on examination papilledema and neck stiffness were also present you can see the ct scan here look at this erode part and these all these you know uh, white appearance here okay hyper dense area what is the diagnosis anybody first of all yes yes please intraventricular hemorrhage and maybe due to severe by the canal hemorrhage okay no, so he intraventricular hemorrhage okay so he is saying intraventricular hemorrhage intraventricular hemorrhage anybody else sir there is a problem in bone on left side mm -hmm. means right side of a patient means here this area you mean this area yes sir okay so what is the diagnosis now listen here okay i will teach you exactly how to solve this type of case a 40 year old non case of hypertension she is a disease you know he has a disease hypertension from a long time 
is a non case diagnosed case presented with severe headache and vomiting for only few hours so something has happened inside his cranial cavity on examination there is papilledema and neck stiffness were present this much clues is enough for me for the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage in subarachnoid hemorrhage there is stiffness of the neck and there is increased intracranial pressure so because of that there is papilledema and look at this typical history severe headache you know non hypertensive okay and there is vomiting as well though the most important cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is berry aneurysm rupture but who knows this patient was having berry aneurysm and because of this hypertension the berry aneurysm has ruptured we don't know so this type of presentation is very typical of subarachnoid hemorrhage sah and ct scan has confirmed that this is known as star sign see this okay this is highly typical of subarachnoid hemorrhage so that's the diagnosis now if this type of case uh, comes to us then after making the diagnosis we need to quickly refer this case to the neurosurgeon neurosurgeon because they are the one who are going to handle this type of case but at the same time some medical management has to be done decrease the blood pressure gradually decrease the uh, you know uh, raise intracranial pressure okay and all these things has to be done see the sah subarachnoid hemorrhage now number 3 so let me go through this and then ask the question to you this is a picture of a newborn who was delivered at home so this is a home delivery case the parents were very worried for this lesion but pediatrician reassured them by saying nothing to worry and it will disappear within the few years okay so what type of lesion is this which you can see on the back of the baby here and here what is this i think mongolian spots excellent excellent very good okay both of them uh, are saying mongolian spot and it is mongolian spot it is it is actually okay the you know formed by melanin pigment this is excessive formation of the melanin pigment in that area so this is a uh, mongolian spot and it will disappear on its own we don't need to do anything regarding this if you do not diagnose in time you know it it can give give rise to a lot of apprehension just like parents the doctor can also be afraid by by uh, you know looking at it but if you know if you have seen this case before even once you will ne never make that mistake again mongolian spot no need of any worry no need of any treatment it will disappear on its own number 4 what genetic condition see there what genetic condition might predispose this patient to develop the disease shown by the chest x ray so first of all you need to diagnose what is this okay condition by looking at the chest x ray and then the question is something else the question is what is the most important genetic predisposing factor for this yes sir i think sir uh, alpha 1 intertrypsin deficiency mm -hmm. good so first of all what sir, is this uh, x ray what is this disease yeah it's emphysema emphysema so what are the points of emphysema you have seen here yes <laughs> sir sir the, the have... di... yes yes one by one yes yes aman yeah sir uh, the x ray is hyper inflated and the diaphragm is also flattened and also the heart is heart is tubular uh, with the uh, with the uh, hyper hyper lucent lung fields okay good so these are the features of emphysema which he is uh, clearly telling here now all of you please uh, pay attention here look at the flattened diaphragm here these are called flat diaphragm always the right dome of the diaphragm should be higher than the left but in this case they are almost at the same level this is called flat diaphragm this flattened diaphragm is because of hyperinflated lungs 
Look at this. If I count, okay, the anterior rib, there are so many. There are definitely more than five or more than six. Now, look at the cardiac shadow. It is very tubular looking shadow. And look at this, uh, you know, lung overall. This lung looks like it has a lot of air inside. And if I see, see this area, see, it is a bit more blacker than the other. So in this uh, disorder, there is formation of bulla in different part of the lung. So this is very typical of emphysema disease, emphysema. Now, uh, uh, what is the, uh, you know, what are the causes of emphysema? Can you tell me two important causes of emphysema here? Then your answer will be right there. What are the two important causes? Smoking. And? Alpha 1 interception. Alpha 1 interception. Very good. Excellent. Smoking and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And the question is about the genetic condition. So the answer is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Excellent. Alpha-1 okay, antitrypsin AT deficiency. So this is the answer here. Now, what, what uh, complication can happen to this patient? What complication? Pneumothorax. Exactly. Very good. That is the number one complication, pneumothorax. And later on, over a period of time, this patient may also develop corpal monel. Okay, but that is quite late. Let's move on. This type of discussion will be quite good for you for your revision. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency leading to emphysema. No, number five, look at this case here. During examination, a newborn was having penis as shown in the picture. The urethral opening was present at the under surface of the glands in this boy. Okay. So see this the urethral opening is present not at the tip okay, of the penis, but it is present on the under surface of the glands. And this is okay, this is the hooded type of propuse, hooded type of propuse. So what is the diagnosis? What is What term we use for this condition? AP, uh, hypospedia. Yes. This AP is, hypospedia. Yeah, this is hypospedia, okay? Hypospedia. Hypospedia is the term we use for the opening which is present at the under surface. And epispedia means if this opening is present somewhere here, okay? On the dorsal surface of the penis. Apis, dorsal surface, hypos on the under surface or on the ventral surface. So hypospedia. Now, what are the problem of hypospedia? What problem? Anybody? Sir, uh, there is a flow in, uh, there is problem in urinary flow and uh, urinary tract infection is very common. Sir. Okay, yes, I agree with him. The flow of the urine is not forward now. See this, the jet of the urine doesn't come like this. Rather, it will come like this below. And this is a, you know, for example, if this is a boy who is going to school and sometimes what the, uh, you know, the friends do, they go to pee together. And by looking at that, you know, the other boys, you know, may start to bully that boy. This, this is one of the big problem, you know, school going kid. Okay, apart from that, the urinary tract infection is there, but the chances are not that exactly high than the other kid. Now, apart from this, when this boy becomes adult, okay, the overall growth of the penis is a problem. The overall growth of the penis because whatever length of the penis which is left distal to the urethral opening, okay, distal, that area okay, doesn't grow properly. So when there is an erection of the penis occurs later on, that area develops acute pain. So all of these are problem of hypospedia. So as soon as it is diagnosed, it should be you know, corrected surgically. Surgical correction is available and they can do it very easily uh, if it is detected quite early. Remember, hypospedia. Okay, hypospedia. Now let's move on. Let's talk about another case. 
This is a 20-year-old patient who developed acute breathlessness for a few days. On auscultation, there were bilateral crackles present at both lung field and gallop rhythm at the apex. And you can see the x-ray right here. So what do you think is the diagnosis? Anybody? Sir, congestive heart failure leading to pulmonary edema. Okay, yes. Congestive heart failure leading to pulmonary edema. Now give, give your explanation from this, you know, picture. Uh, there is a ground glass appearance and uh, there is also, I think, sir, the curly B lines is there, sir, mm -hmm. with uh, bronchovascular marking also seen. Okay. And from the clinical clues? Some points from the clinical clues? Sir, uh, sir bilateral basal crackles and uh, gallop rhythm. Excellent. So I'm sure many other students also know this case, but this is one of the commonest case you will see in your clinical practice. In any cardiac hospital, whenever you visit, you know, a lot of these x-rays you will see there. This is a case of pulmonary edema. Look at this x-ray here, ground glass appearance, okay? The right lung is affected more than the left, but nevertheless, left is also affected. These are a bit of bat wing appearance at the hilum of the lung, okay? And overall, uh, there is ground glass appearance. This is a clear cut case of pulmonary edema and which is supported by the clinical clues. Acute breathlessness, okay? On auscultation, bilateral crackles and gallop rhythm. Gallop rhythm is a feature of left ventricular failure. So all of these things together makes this diagnosis as a pulmonary edema, most probably caused by left ventricular failure. So pulmonary edema caused by left ventricular failure, okay? What is the treatment you give for left ventricular failure leading to pulmonary edema? What is the drug of choice? What is the first drug you want to give here? Yes? Morphine and uh, diuretics. Okay. Morphine and diuretics. I'll give flusamide or the diuretics first to flush out or to redistribute the fluid which is collected inside the lung. And I'll give morphine also. Morphine is also a very important drug here just to, you know, decrease the agitation in the patient. And it also, uh, you know, cause a bit of vasodilation in the periphery. Apart from that, okay, I will give oxygen. Don't forget oxygen as the treatment here. Oxygen is very, very necessary in this case um, because majority of the patients are already hypoxic. Apart from there, we can give vasodilator drug, okay? Uh, you can, you know, uh, increase the contractility of the heart by giving inotropic support and all those things. Now, let's move further. Let's go to the case number seven. A 12-year-old girl is presented with painful swelling and bleeding of the gum for three weeks duration. So her age is 12, okay? She presented with painful swelling and bleeding of the gum for three weeks duration. CBC was done and it revealed hemoglobin of eight gram per deciliter. WBC count 56,000 and platelet count is 48,000. Now, first of all, give me a comment on this CBC. What do you think this CBC? Yes, is it normal? No, sir. Can you comment on that? Yes, Khatir. So what's wrong there? Sir, the uh, hemoglobin level is uh, less than 11, so it may be anemic patient. Mm -hmm. And this... Okay. And in, in this patient may be AML because of gum hypertrophy and bleeding. Okay, so you think this is a case of AML. Okay, anybody else? He's right. This is a case of acute myeloid leukemia. That is a more chance of, you know, uh, I can pick that as a number one differential diagnosis by looking at this clinical picture and this CBC along with this, you know, 
uh, picture of the patient. So she's 12 year old girl. Okay, AML is not that common in 12 year old girl. AML can occur quite commonly. Painful swelling and bleeding of the gum, one of the very typical feature of leukemia, acute leukemia, especially, okay, M4 and M5 type of AML. CBC, also showing anemia, okay, high WBC count. Remember, in case of AML, uh, the presentation can be anything regarding WBC count. It may be low than the normal. It may be normal range or it may be even higher. So that is what is shown here, higher than normal, and platelet count is low, thrombocytopenia. So acute leukemia, or most probably AML. And uh, let me share one of my clinical experience, okay, a few years ago, few years means already, you know, 10 to 12 years ago now, one of the girl of the exact age, that's why I gave this case to you actually from, from that girl, you know, I still remember her, this girl, one of my distant relative actually, she has the same presentation exactly like this, nothing else. She was going to school till that day, no problem whatsoever, only one week of bleeding from the gum when she brushed, that's it, nothing else. No tiredness, nothing, no other complaint whatsoever. But when I you know, examined her, then a bit of hypertrophy of the gum was present, present just like that, you know? So I, I had uh, this, you know, isn't it, knowledge. So I just requested them uh, to have CBC and peripheral smear. And CBC with peripheral smear was a bit of abnormal finding. And in that girl, uh, the count was on the lower side. All, all cells are decreased. It's a case of pancytopenia actually. So I requested them to go for bone marrow analysis. And when the bone marrow report comes, all of us were shocked. There were 100% blood cells present in the bone marrow, 100%, unbelievable, okay? So this is a very, very, you know, uh, uh, important case. Remember, any time you may come across this type of case, and if you diagnose this in time, you know, it will give you a lot of satisfaction. And who knows, this patient may survive if the treatment is done well in a good center. This is a case of AML. Bone marrow aspiration revealed acute myeloid leukemia, M4 type. Let's move on. This is another case, see here. This patient presented with severe abdominal pain for a few hours. On further questioning, he said he was taking endomethacin for joint pain for the last few weeks. On examination, board-like rigidity was present on the anterior abdominal wall. So what is the diagnosis here? Who can, who can solve this case? Anybody? Yes, guys? Sir, it may be a peptic ulcer. Maybe a peptic ulcer disease, okay? Anybody? Yes, sir. I'll come back to you, okay? I'll come back to you. Yes? Yes? Yes, yes. Now see there. Okay, we don't have enough time. You know, if your answer is a not coming. Perforation. Okay, now he's uh, he has modified his answer. He's saying this is a case of peptic ulcer perforation. Absolutely correct. Now, now the answer is complete. Now see this. See this uh, clinical correlation. This patient was having severe abdominal pain for a few hours and he was taking NSAID drug for a long time. NSAID are the usual cause of peptic ulceration, but this X-ray and this clinical clue has really given you the hint here. On examination, there is board-like rigidity. That means this is a case of peritonitis, and peptic ulcer perforation can give rise to peritonitis, which is confirmed by the X-ray gas under the diaphragm. See this, this is the gas under diaphragm on both sides. Sometimes on the left side is difficult for us to interpret, but definitely easier on the right. 
gas under the diaphragm. Case of a uh, peptic ulcer perforation because of this clinical correlation. Now, what type of treatment we like to do here? Yes, what is the treatment? Surgical, sir. Exactly. Okay, treatment is surgery. Take this patient for the operation room. Okay, after resuscitation, open the peritoneal cavity, and then uh, wash out all the things from there, whatever substance is leaking in the peritoneal cavity, find out the perforation and patch it. Patching of the perforation should be done. This is a case of pneumoperitoneum, most probably due to acute peptic ulcer perforation. Very good diagnosis. Now, see here, we have included some of the ECGs also. So this, let's take this opportunity to revise a bit of, uh, you know, ECG as well. So all of you uh, have a look here, okay? Uh, take a piece of paper and, and a pen with you and try to diagnose this ECG. No clinical clues are provided here. You have to read this ECG. Yes, just take a bit of time, okay? Ventricular fibrillation. You think this is a case of ventricular fibrillation? Mm -hmm. Along with that, okay, I'll come to you. Along with that, uh, yes, try try to pick anterior wall, anterior wall, anterior wall, MI, ST elevation. Okay, anterior wall, MI. Okay, uh, there is ST elevation. So, in which lead you have found ST elevation? Let's talk like that. V1, V2, V3, V4. Good, V2. P3, very good. V4, yes, V4, okay. Not not really in V5 or V6, right? V5, a little bit, I can still see a little bit, see that? In V5 also. Yes, sir. Yes. So these are ST segment elevation. Good. Now, uh, I cannot ignore his answer also. If I look at the lead two, see there? These are a very bizarre looking wave. These are not regular at all. So probably this patient is going towards ventricular fibrillation. Yes, that, that can be added. But if all this 12 lead ECG is given to you, then they are not only asking for ventricular fibrillation. They are asking for the interpretation of ischemic heart disease, probably, like MI. So the clue here is, look at each of the you know, lead, one, two, three, okay, and run your eyes through you know, AVL, AVF, and V1 to V6 like that. Okay, so the we have already got the diagnosis here. So this is anterior lateral wall MI. Now why lateral? Why anterior? You have picked it correctly. Why lateral is also added there? AVL maybe sir, ST elevation a little bit in AVL lead. See this? Absolutely, see this, okay? Uh, this one and also V5, V5 is also affected. So uh, lead one, lead AVL, V5 and V6 are the lateral lead. Lead one, AVL, V5 and V6 are the lateral one. And V1, V2, V3 and V4 are the anterior one. So both are uh, affected. That's why anterior lateral MI, that is the point. Now, number 10, so just look at it and tell me the diagnosis. It's I Mobitz type one. Type one heart block. Why it is type one? Yes. Give me reason. The PR in PR interval is increasing. PR interval is increasing. Okay. I'll come back to you. Anybody else? And sir, the sir, QRS complex is also absent. Okay, so he says QRS is Mobitz type 1 because uh, after one beat QRS complex is missing, sir, in mm -hmm. each. Okay, so you think after one one beat, the QRS complex is missing, like here. Okay. The PR interval is also increased, sir. Mm -hmm. In some... Yes, yes, any other student, please? One more. 
there, there is a can, can progressive lengthening of qr interval with um, absence uh, absence of uh, qr uh, qrs complex so this is a second degree hard block type 1 so what is that you mean second degree hard block type 1 the mobis type 1 or winky back winky back phenomena you mean yes sir now yes, all sir. of you, okay okay fine fine let, let me let me describe this right here in front of you and then uh, you yourself are going to tell what is the diagnosis here yeah. so let, let's pick up the finding here these are the p wave this is p wave this is pr interval or pq interval whatever you want to say this is qrs complex okay q rs complex this is another qrs complex and this is another qrs complex so definitely this is a you know type of heart block because the qrs complexes are so less and look at the distance or gap between the two r wave so many one two three four five six seven almost eight even more than eight complete heart blocks okay now wait <laughs> i will come to you okay now look at this you know do you really think this p wave is uh, you know leading to this qrs or this qrs is occurring on its own that's the big point we need to answer here and the reason is or the answer is this qrs is occurring on its own from the ventricle side these p waves are not passing towards the ventricle at all these p waves are occurring on their own and qrs complexes are occurring on their own here okay they are occurring on their own see there where is the uh, uh, qrs complex of this p wave i cannot see any see this this is also p wave actually this is also p this is p this is also p why the gap is so less here why the gap is substantially more here and even more here that means these p wave are not creating or causing this qrs complex p on their own qrs complexes on their own means there is a complete blockade of the p wave going towards the ventricle that is one thing another one look at this uh, morphology of the qrs complex they are quite wide and bizarre and if they originate from the ventricle they appear like this so this is complete heart block complete heart block okay or type 3 heart block this is the way uh, we diagnose this case and the treatment is pacemaker now another one okay see there what can you see here and what's the diagnosis inferior wall mi st elevation 2 3 avf lead 2 very good 3 and avf avf very good there are st elevation excellent apart from this can you comment something else what else can you see here good what else st depression see this st depression in lead 1 right this is lead one st depression you can clearly see in two and three elevation he has picked it nicely uh, avl it is depressed see there it is depressed in avl okay avf it is elevated and see this v1 is depressed okay v1 now this v1 is depressed v2 is also depressed okay. there is a inversion of t wave also so in in uh, 2, 3, and AVF, there is a clear cut case of ST elevation. So, no doubt about it. This is a you know, inferior wall MI. But what, how, how do I uh, comment on, on other? This is known as okay, reciprocal change. If some uh, particular lead is having ST elevation, other lead will develop reciprocal change. So, I don't care about those reciprocal change. I just mentioned that in my diagnosis, but still the diagnosis belongs to uh, inferior wall MI because ST elevation is always more important than uh, ST depression and other things. So inferior MI with reciprocal changes is anterolateral lead. Excellent. Now, number 12, see there?
can you pick the finding here Sir, ventricular hypertrophy. Why? Why did you say that? Yes. Can you give reason to me? Sir, V one and uh, V two, the R wave, sir, and uh -huh. uh, and in the V five and V six, the length of S uh, S wave. You so the R wave in V five, V six, and V one, V two, S wave. So you think uh, they are more than normal? They are taller. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. I'll come okay. back to it. No problem. Now see that. So lateral wall ST elevation MI. Lateral wall ST elevation MI. Why? Why did you say that? Sir, there is ST elevation in lead one and also AVL. So the already I got two leads from lateral side, which is having ST elevation. Now see that. Let Let us confirm. See this lead one definite ST elevation very good ST elevation is there okay two there is no ST elevation three there is depression rather okay uh, we don't look at AVR AVL yes there is definite elevation ST elevation and there is depression so one and AVL there are ST elevation he has picked very correctly uh, there is a, a bit of depression here depression okay depression uh, this is uh, isoelectric line no depression no elevation. V5, okay. I cannot, you know, confirm it. It is a bit, uh, you know, controversial here, and there is no elevation. So, one and AVL, the definite elevation. So this is a case of, you know, lateral wall MI. Absolutely correct. Lateral wall MI. I cannot call it anterolateral because the anterior leads are rather, uh, you know, depressed. V1, V2, V3. They have no elevation of ST segment. And another one, you know, for your uh, criteria, this, uh, you know, a tall is not enough, okay? Uh, if we add, it should be more than 35 mm. It doesn't look like 35 mm. So this is uh, uh, the one lead, isn't it? It's very clear. You can clearly see this here, a lead uh, one and lead AVL. See this, lead AVL, okay? It has clear cut. ST segment elevation. Apart from that, you know, uh, this is the case of lateral wall. So, here. So, let us move further. So, this lateral wall MI with reciprocal change in anterior and inferior leads. Now, this is another uh, ECG. So all of you, please uh, focus here and try to diagnose. What is this? Mobits type two, sir. Movies type two. Why can you give reason here? Sir, for two P waves, one QRS complex. So two P wave, one QRS complex. So you think this is movies to two to one a block. Anybody else? I'll come back to you. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? So with mistake, I have flipped it, you know. So he's right. This is uh, movies uh, type two heart block. This is uh, one of the major type of heart block. And this uh, severity is just, you know, a little bit less than a type three heart block. So in movies type two, oh, suddenly, you know, there is a loss of the uh, QRS complex. Now see this. This P is followed by QRS and T. It is nice here, but uh, there is one P, but where is the QRS complex after that? So it is missing, okay? Again, P, QRS complex. 
okay t p and q x complex okay so uh, again it is missing so this is a highly suggestive of a movies a type 2 heart block movies type 2 heart block good now let's move further so this is another case please focus here there is a history of sudden onset of hemiparesis of left half of the body and look at this uh, you know ct scan I correlate that uh, these two things and tell me the diagnosis ischemic stroke ischemic stroke okay why why it is ischemic why not hemorrhagic because it is hypodense in the hemorrhagic there is hypodense and plus a white type of lesion occur mean very white good. bone density occur very good excellent that 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 tells everything very good explanation i look at this clinical scenario and look at the ct it is a hypodense type of lesion which is a feature of ischemia not hemorrhage hemorrhage is hypodense lesion so this is a case of ischemic type of stroke wonderful Okay, cerebral infarction of right hemisphere. Now, question number 15. This is also easy thing for you. So see here, a 25 year old patient presented with partial seizure for a few days. So partial seizure. Treatment was done with praziquantel, steroid, and carbamazepine. Look at this CT scan and tell us the diagnosis. Neurocystic sarcosis. So this is a case of neurocystic sarcosis. Absolutely, it is absolutely correct. These clues are enough for the diagnosis. See this. What is this uh, lesion called, Aman? What is the lesion called in CT? Ring enhancement lesion. Very good. This is known as ring enhancing a ring enhancement lesion. And with this uh, clinical correlation, this is absolutely crystal clear. And this is a case of neurocystic sarcosis. Praziquantel is the drug which we give to kill this larval form. Steroids are given to decrease the chance of anaphylaxis, and carbamazepine is given to control this partial seizure. So, neurocystic sarcosis. What is the causative agent of neurocystic sarcosis? Tinea solium. Tinea solium. It's a type of tapeworm. Okay, it's a, it is also known as, it is known as pork tapeworm, pork tapeworm. Excellent. Neurocystic sarcosis is the case. Now, spot diagnosis, okay? No clinical clues are given, just the X-ray and uh, uh, we have asked the diagnosis. Sometimes question are asked like that. So can you tell me what is this? Sir, this, this is the right side fluid effusion. Mm -hmm. Right sided pleural effusion. Okay. Anybody else? A pleural effusion. Okay. He's also saying pleural yes, fluid. Effusion. Yes, yes, please be confident and answer. Yes. Sir, air fluid level and the diagnosis is pleural effusion. So, air fluid level, he has picked one more thing here, but he's still saying pleural effusion as the diagnosis. Okay. Anybody else? Now, now the points are already there. You have picked it very correctly. Yes, this is a homogeneous opacity on the right thorax. Okay, I cannot see any CP angle here. CP angle is not seen. Uh, other side CP angle is very clear. So uh, most probably this is a fluid, but remember, when there is a uh, this is straight line like this, you need to add one more thing here. This is probably a case of hydro pneumothorax. This is a you know a bit of here also here. Otherwise, uh, it should not happen like this. A straight line will never be there. There will be meniscus or a S sign in case of pleural effusion. If a straight line is there, hydro pneumothorax. Okay, so you will. Uh, get enough chance to say hydroneumothorax if you repeatedly say this is a case of fluid effusion because you are almost there. Okay, almost there. See this right sided hydroneumothorax. This hydro 
or new sorry pneumo term is there because of that straight line which is seen because air always goes up and the boundary between the air and fluid is denoted by one straight line that is the diagnosis